Hello and welcome back to Biochemistry Pathway Series for Step 1, courtesy of 12daysinmarch.com, where we'll be discussing some of the highest yield biochemical pathways for the Step 1 boards exam. So again, for each pathway, we're going to try to focus on not memorizing every step and intermediate of each pathway, but rather remembering key aspects that will help us reason our way through each one. So in terms of key aspects, we want to focus on where does each pathway start, where does each pathway end, what are the goals of the pathway, or what is the purpose that the pathway serves within a cell? What are key enzymes that will get us from start to end, and what do they need to function? As well as key disorders related to all of the pathways. And again, another aspect we try to focus on is how different pathways come together, with the idea that if you can integrate the pathways, it's easy to reason your way through a question about any one of them. So of course for this pathway, we're going to start with homocysteine, and end with either cysteine or methionine. The goal of our pathway is to generate cysteine and methionine, but most importantly we need to focus on the purpose of getting rid of homocysteine for reasons that we'll talk about later. Key enzymes involved in this pathway are homocysteine methyltransferase and cystathione synthase. The main disorder associated with this pathway is homocysteinuria, which can either be hereditary or a result of vitamin deficiency. This fits nicely into pathways for folate, B12, and nucleotide synthesis, which we'll see in the integrated pathway model. Looking at our integrated pathways, we can see that the homocysteine elimination pathway fits nicely with the HMP shunt and the nucleotide synthesis pathway. And again, today we'll be focusing specifically on homocysteine elimination, but it's important to be able to reference back to this slide to see how it fits nicely in with the process of nucleotide synthesis. So let's actually write out the pathway for elimination of homocysteine. You can see in the way that we've laid it out here that homocysteine is actually at the middle. And this is to emphasize the fact that it's so important to get rid of homocysteine that the cell has actually developed two separate pathways to get rid of it. Looking to the right, we can see that one of these pathways involves forming cysteine. So the first step in this pathway is going from homocysteine to cystathione using the enzyme cystathione synthase. Now this enzyme requires vitamin B6 to work as a cofactor. And as we'll see, if B6 is deficient, this pathway towards cysteine won't work as efficiently. The next step in the pathway is of course going from cystathione to cysteine through enzymes that aren't important to memorize for your step one exam. The pathway to the left is dictated by homocysteine methyltransferase. And as the name implies, this pathway essentially involves tacking on a methyl group to homocysteine to form methionine. Now what does this pathway require? This pathway actually requires two separate vitamins. So if you look on the right pathway, it only requires B6. But the pathway on the left is going to require both B9, folate, and B12. So how does this all come together? So when we ingest vitamin B9, also known as folate, it comes in with a methyl group attached to it. Now this is a problem for a couple reasons. The first reason is that the main purpose of folate is to play a role in nucleotide synthesis, but it can't do this job with the methyl group attached. And so now we have homocysteine, which needs a methyl group to be eliminated, and B9, which needs to get rid of its methyl group in order to function properly. So really homocysteine methyltransferase is serving two purposes. It is one, tacking off that methyl group from B9 and putting it on homocysteine to form methionine. And again, this process requires vitamin B12 to work properly. Now, normally within cells, both of these pathways are happening at the same time. And what we'll see that if one side isn't working properly, you'll end up pushing down the other side. So if the pathway towards cysteine isn't working properly, we'll start accumulating more methionine. And if the methionine pathway isn't working properly, we'll start accumulating more cysteine. And this is going to help us work through what's going wrong when we're presented with a patient who has elevated homocysteine. So for all intents and purposes moving forward, I want to think of us as going down either the B6 pathway to the right, or the B12 pathway to the left. So I've said multiple times that the main purpose of this pathway is to get rid of homocysteine, but why do we want to get rid of it? So it turns out that during development, if you have excess homocysteine, you can end up with developmental delay, you can get early osteoporosis, ocular abnormalities, thromboembolic disease, and this really ends up resulting in severe premature atherosclerosis. So you'll see people as young as 10 to 15 developing severe complications from this, such as heart attack and even stroke. So again, in terms of either problems or treatment, you need to figure out ways to get rid of homocysteine. So how does this pathway actually go wrong and end up developing that homocysteine excess? So pathway dysfunction can either be caused by a severe vitamin deficiency, as we said, you know, the right side of pathway is dependent on B6, the left in our past diagram was dependent on B12 or B9, or more commonly is from a congenital deficiency of any of the enzymes involved, so people will be born without those enzymes functioning. For the purpose of boards, we're going to focus on the presentation in children who have a congenital loss of one of these enzymes. And when these do occur, they're all autosomal recessive. So how is a child with a loss of one of these enzymes going to present? So again, we'll see signs of severe premature atherosclerotic disease, usually before age 20, which is usually going to be a stroke or a heart attack. 
you'll see lens issues, which is going to present as lens sublection, which they'll usually just talk about as vision problems. These patients may or may not be described as having a marfanoid habitus. Um, so a marfanoid habitus, actually, I want you to think about Abraham Lincoln. He's someone that people talk about as potentially having had marfans. And so these people are usually tall, slender. They'll talk about having elongated digits or maybe a kyphotic spine. So if you hear about young children who are described that way, I want this to be on your radar as well. But basically, if you boil it down, if you hear about someone under the age of 20 having a major stroke or heart attack, you need to be thinking about the homocysteine pathway. So a lot of the questions on this pathway are going to also ask you for a treatment strategy. And the general rule for thinking about treatment is that you have a pathway that can go in one of two directions. And one is going to be cut off either by an enzyme deficiency or a vitamin deficiency. And the way that you're going to think about treatment is by giving back what you're losing on the cut off pathway and trying to push homocysteine down the open pathway to prevent accumulation. So let's take a look at an example of one of these issues. So let's say that our problem is a cystathione synthase deficiency, which is cutting off our pathway on the right side. So we just don't have that enzyme and we can't get around it. So again, the presentation is going to be symptoms related to elevated homocysteine that we talked about. But in addition, you're going to have high methionine and low cysteine. And this is because, again, you can't move down the right side of pathway, so the body's going to start shunting you down the left side of pathway. So how do we go about fixing it? So again, we need to supplement what we're losing from the broken pathway, so we need to give that cysteine back. But the problem that we're worried about is the homocysteine building up. And so we need to create incentive for homocysteine to go down the left side of pathway. And we're going to achieve this by supplementing vitamins B12 and B9, so the tools that you need for this pathway to work, as well as actually reducing the amount of methionine in the diet. Because if we think about it, if there's lots of methionine, homocysteine isn't going to get, want to get pushed that way. If we have less methionine in the diet, there's more incentive for homocysteine to become converted to it. So again, ultimately what we're doing is we're supplementing where the pathway is broken towards cysteine, and we're creating a sink for homocysteine on the other side. Let's take a look at the opposite case. So let's say we have a congenital deficiency of homocysteine methyltransferase. So the left side of pathway is broken. We need to approach treatment, one, by giving back what's broken. So we need to give back methionine and pushing down the open pathway by supplementing with vitamin B6. And this again achieves our goal of supplementing what's gone and at the same time creating a sink for homocysteine to prevent it from accumulating. So in reality, the most common way in which this pathway is disrupted is not by lacking cystathione synthase, but by having a less efficient enzyme. And again, while this is the most common in the real world, it's actually the least common on boards because it's a bit more nuanced than the prior problems that we had talked about. Um, in this case, essentially, the enzyme just has less affinity for vitamin B6, so it doesn't work as efficiently. And the way that you can treat this is just by giving more vitamin B6. So if you can supplement B6 back in, it brings this enzyme back up to functional status, and you don't have the same problems. So let's take a look at some questions that are going to be talking about this pathway. So in this question, you can see that we have a 35-year-old man. He goes to the emergency department, and he has an EKG that is confirming an MI. So they run a lab panel, and they show that he has normal total cholesterol. And so he's relatively young, and they're actually telling you that the usual cause of an MI is completely normal. And then they flat out give you an elevated serum homocysteine level. So they're definitely asking you about this pathway. But then they go further. They then go on to say that genetic testing reveals a mutation affecting activity of homocysteine methyltransferase that leads to a decrease in function. This leads to impaired ability to convert homocysteine to what end product? So again, this is just a straight knowledge question. Do you know the pathway or don't? And if we look at our pathway, we can look that we're talking about the left side. So this patient lacks homocysteine methyltransferase, which is going to end up producing methionine, which if we go back is option C. And another mnemonic, just a way of thinking about this, you know, if they're asking which direction are you heading, they all kind of share similar names. So if we look at the right side pathway, it's all cysts. And if we look at the left side pathway, it's all methionine, you know, meth transferase, methyl. So that's another way to think about it. Let's take a look at a more typical question now. So here we have a 15-year-old boy. He's brought to the emergency department with crushing chest pain that he developed while playing soccer. Physical examination shows a tall, slender boy with elongated digits and mild kyphosis. So this has to be a big trigger. So if you're looking at a tall, slender boy with elongated digits and mild kyphosis, you need to be thinking that this is a marfanoid habitus. Uh, there's a few different conditions that are associated with a marfanoid habitus, but when you put it in context of someone who sounds like they're having a heart attack, you need to automatically think that this is a problem with homocysteine. So going through the rest of the problem, we see that we're confirming uh, an MI, and they performed a number of studies afterwards that show a marked elevation of serum homocysteine and methionine with decreased levels of cysteine. Further evaluation shows a complete loss of function mutation in cystathione synthase. So in addition to cysteine supplementation, long-term management would involve increased what in the diet? So this is giving us a few things. We know that there's a problem with getting rid of homocysteine, and they're actually giving us the broken pathway. 
So let's take a look at our treatment plans. So here we know that we have a broken cystathione synthase, and we know that in order to treat it, we one need to give back what's missing, which is cysteine, and we need to supplement in order to push homocysteine in the other direction. So we want to reduce the amount of methionine, which isn't what they're asking, but also to push homocysteine to the left, we need to give back B12 and B9, which is option B. So those are two ways that I want you to think about questions relating to the homocysteine elimination pathway. And again, it's important to reference back to this slide to put it in context. So the methyl group that we talked about earlier and the role of folate in B12 actually ties in very nicely with the pathway for nucleotide synthesis, which will be in another video. But again, if you can keep all these three pathways in your head, it really helps to contextualize problems and help work your way through different issues. And again, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to email us at 12daysinmarch.com.